host today. And today we have Hamish. Oh, there you are. Um, Hamish from Convex Accounting is here with us today. I'm really excited to have you on. And you always bring to mind or you always are talking about what's top of mind. And one of the things that is generally top of mind, I think, with businesses is obviously budgeting and understanding how to best use your money or work with the finance, the cash flow that you have um, and when to reinvest and when to, you know, pull back a little bit. So today we're talking about budgeting, creating permission to spend, not control, which is an interesting take, I think, because most of the time we're talking about, you know, don't spend, don't spend, you know, but actually I'm, I have a feeling that we're going to be getting into why it is important to invest in our business and what are the right ways to kind of do that. So I'm looking forward to learning something here because I think that accounting, although may not be seen as the sexiest part of business, um, is the most important part, really. I mean, it's the money that gets us forward. It helps us to grow. It helps us to know when we can um, scale up and hire people to help us out. So as we are here on multiple channels, and I know a lot of you folks tune in on social media, I just want to put a reminder in that providers and suppliers feature offers for digital boost, digital boost <laughs> users uh, on our website. So if you're not registered to actually digital boost and you've just been cheekily watching on our social media channels, make sure you register to the website because you have access to not only so many providers um, offers and discounts, um, actually, we've got a new tool and it's called Checkable and it's an AI system and you can drop your website in there and your social media channels and it'll do a full diagnostic and tell you areas that you can improve. So um, do reach out if you need some assistance with that support at digitalboost.co.nz. Now, if you've got questions for Hamish today, please drop them in the chat, the comment section, the QA, Q&A function, no matter where you are, please participate. We want to make these sessions work for you. So Hamish, it looks like you're ready now. We're good. Oh, I am good. And I'm Perfect. just frantically getting all of the different social media channels open. So there's nothing worse than just listening to me babble on. So the more interactive we make this, as my face has disappeared, there we go. the more interactive <laughs> we make this, the, the better for everyone. So if you've got questions, pop them in the chat. I'd love to, to kind of hear and engage with you as we go, because it's going to make it much more fun for everyone. Absolutely. I'm going to open up all the chats myself so I can see what's going on. And um, yeah. And if there are any questions, I can help facilitate there. Beautiful. And look, I think your introductory comments were bang on the money, you know, historically budgeting. I don't know what's going on with my camera, but I'm just going to box on. Um, Historically, budgeting has been this really painful thing. And look, the secret is I'm an accountant, right? And I hate budgeting. I hate it with an absolute passion. So I don't do it at home. I don't do it in my business. Um, and it just kind of grates me. Because if you go back, historically, a budget has been this thing that has been really controlling and it's been really... Um, kind of painful. And it's been this thing that stopped us from spending rather than this thing that's given us a real permission to spend. So I look at it and go, if we're going to have a budget, let's use it in a way that's powerful for us, not in a way that sits in a bottom drawer kind of next to your business plan and doesn't end up getting used. So it's not about control. It's not about bad. It's not about any of that. It's about going, how do we move forward? How do we benchmark our performance against what we said we were going to do? in a way that helps us get there quicker. It's not necessarily about the assumption or the ratios or anything like that that your accountant probably tells you to do. So they'll look at it and go, if your turnover is up, your expenses should be up and it all should stay in, in, in balance with each other. And it's boring and it's crap. I know that's a little controversial coming from an accountant. Um, but it's just not that interesting. So I look at it and go, you know, we've got to do it a new way. We've got to do it a way that kind of, is about giving us permission to spend. It's about checking the logic and making sure that we've thought about things the right way rather than it just being the thing we do. It's about going, let's come up with a plan and accept that the plan is going to be wrong. Let's just use the budget as this processing tool to, to come up with a really clear and robust plan because ultimately, for me, a budget 
it's about carrot and stick, right? Like you've got your, your carrot there and the budget goes, if we get to this place over here, we get to eat the carrot and we're all happy. But all too often it becomes the stick, right? Like the stick that goes, you haven't done well enough. You're not doing enough. You should work harder. You should be more profitable or, or you, you could be doing more. And we just get it so, so wrong. So we go, I hit my budget, I get a holiday, or I hit my budget, I get a thing, or I didn't hit my budget, I'm going to smash myself. So we end up chasing numbers for the sake of chasing numbers. You know, the, the budget becomes this thing that we do for the sake of itself. There's no connection to why your business exists in the first place. There's no connection to what your business's strategy is. So you end up with a business plan that says, we want to double our business's growth in the coming two years. You have a budget that goes, we'll double all the numbers and we'll see where we go. You put the budget in the bottom drawer and you forget about it because you're so busy chasing your business plan or your business plan ends up in the bottom drawer as well and you end up just fighting fires the whole way through. And it's crap. We've got to change it. So then you go, well, okay, Hamish, you're well and good. You say you want to change up budgeting, but... What does that actually look like? Um, the good news is we've got a bit of a plan. So if you scan that QR code, we are so good at QR codes now after the last wee while, scan that QR code and what it's going to do is take you to our website and in it you can download a template for you to use for your budgeting moving forward. It looks a little something like this. And in it what we're going is this is how I think you should budget. And it's not just what I think, it's based off the research we've done with hundreds of our customers. And off the back of it, you'll see results. So I run two businesses, me and my wife, Convex Accounting, Convex Legal. Convex Legal's budget saw them increase their turnover 56% in the last 12 months, 56% off the back of a strong budget with a strong plan with really good execution. Um, my wife is exceptionally executing and she did a brilliant job, better than what I am. So their growth was much higher than ours. So the legal's growth was much higher than the accounting's growth because she followed her budget to a T and it was really clear and it was really well connected back to her budget. So scan the QR code or, where's my finger? Scan the QR code, or if you can't, go to convexaccounting.co.nz slash budgeting. You can download it there, um, and I'm going to work through that in a couple of seconds with you all. But while you're grabbing that, there's this guy here, Dwight Eisenhower, and he's quite smart. You know, he knew what he was doing. And when I first set up Convex, I hated budgeting, still do, hated it then even more, because I'm like, well, what's the point in coming up with a budget when we're growing so fast? And the budget that I put in today will be wrong in three months' time from now. So I'm just not going to bother. I'm like, well, what's the point when it's going to be wrong? And what Eisenhower said is that all plans are wrong. And so too will your budget. So budgeting doing it the old way, budgeting doing it the new way, it is going to be wrong. And that's okay. So I think that's the first thing to hang on to. And then you go, well, if it's going to be wrong, what's the point? And as he pointed out, the value of a budget or the value of a plan isn't the plan. It's the process you go through to get the plan in the first place. So this template is fundamentally based around a planning process. So I don't care whether your budget says your motor vehicle expenses are going to go up or down. It doesn't really matter. What I care about is that you've thought about what your motor vehicle expenses are going to do relative to the why of your business or relative to where you want to go. That's the important part, not the fact that you've budgeted X for this and Y for that. I just don't care about it. So while Eisenhower tells us that the budgeting process is the important thing, not the budget itself, we've still been doing it wrong. You know, in 1984, the Harvard Business Review turns out around and goes, budgeting is to, to set uh, budgeting is to set targets for revenue and expenses, then to increase the likelihood that those expenses or those targets will be hit. It's kind of what we're doing now. So you go to your accountant and your accountant says, do a budget. You do a budget. And that's great. 
but you don't use it. And I'm just sitting that with you and I'm laboring the point because if we set a target and just use it as this thing to smack ourselves over the head with, we don't go anywhere. And the Harvard Business Review since 1984 have come out and said budgeting is broken, that we need to turn our budgeting processes upside, and upside down. And they're talking about big business, they're talking about small business, they're talking about everything in between. But we haven't done it. We still do it the old way. We don't change what we do. So that's the thing that I just want to bang on and on and on about is that we have done our budgeting the same way since 1984 and the world has changed. God knows all of us have experienced change in the last two years, but we're still doing the same thing and it's crap and it needs to change. So hopefully you've downloaded the spreadsheet. And from it, what I'm trying to do is instead of making this about numbers for the sake of numbers, I'm trying to draw a connection between the why or why your business exists in the first place. This is awkward. I've just looked at my wrist and I've noticed that I've got a bat on my wrist, which was given to me by my daughter this morning, school holidays. So I'll take that off. Um, and hopefully she doesn't bust through the doors behind me in the coming moments. Um, I go, let's, Work out what the why is of your business. You know, Simon, Simon Sinek, right? He's taught us all of this kind of stuff. So work out what that why is and then go, if that's the long-term thing, what are the rules that are in the middle? What are the rules that guide our spending? So if I'm going, I want to double the size of my accounting firm, does the rule in the middle say that I want to double all my expenses? No, it doesn't. It goes to double... I need to invest in staff capability or I need to invest in the technology that underpins my business. And from that, I then go, well, I don't just want to double my expenses. I might want to triple the expenses or triple the amount of money that I spend on my technology. And yeah, I'm telling you to spend more money and that's okay. Because if we get the rules in the middle, we're going to hit our why quicker. Thank you, Simon Sinek. We're going to know what we can spend money on. So when down the bottom, we're actually you know, swiping the FPOS card or doing the tap and go thing. We don't have guilt. If we've gone out and bought new iPads for our whole team, if that gets us towards the why quicker because we've got better technological ability in our business, then spend the money, fill your boots, go nuts. But if you're buying the iPad simply because you had a thousand bucks in the budget, so you had to spend the budget on something, well... I'm sorry, but it's just not good enough in, in today's environment. It's just not good enough. So we go, if we've got the rule in the middle and the spending is in line with the rule, whether it's budgeted or not, if it's in line with the rules, so it's getting us towards our strategy quicker, then we're in a much better place. So look, if you've downloaded the template, which hopefully you have, I'm going to step you through how to use it. And I'm gonna show you what we do for convex accounting because I think it's really useful. So here we go. Let me just get this set up. I'm going to apologize in advance because my handwriting is rubbish. So hopefully you're following along. Um, but if we look at a budget, to begin with what I'm showing you doesn't look anything like a budget. And there's a very good reason for this. So I look at it and go, what are the key focuses for the coming four quarters? What are the things that you're going to be looking at every single month, which if you execute on, will drive you towards your business's why as quickly as possible? So for convex accounting, right? I look at it and go, the 2022 financial year, so the March year that just finished, was to be honest, really bad for us. We made some bad strategic choices and 
we had some staff churn, which means some customers got pissed off at us. And that's awkward, but I'm kind of comfortable with it now. So I go, well, the focus for our first quarter is customer, customer re-engagement, which in practice looked like me phoning a whole chunk of customers or our team calling a whole chunk of customers to, to try and keep people happy, trying to keep them online. And then you go, well, our quarter two focus is is a group a group coaching program. So I know how to grow my business. I've done it. I know how to grow businesses with for our clients because we've done it. So if we can get some scale in our business model and do that in a group coaching environment, then there's a significant change to our bottom line. Then I go quarter three is about how we integrate the legal offering into our business. And then you go, well, if we execute on all of this, then for quarter four, we're probably going to be looking at some recruitment. And all of this has a connection into the why. So the reason that we exist is to kind of simplify the technical stuff. And to educate. So if we can educate our customers and our staff, then I'm, then I'm happy as a business owner. If I can simplify some technical things for people, then I'm happy. And I know that is very centric to convex accounting, but the same will apply for, for all of the businesses. So if you game, dump the wire for your business into the chat. And I'm happy to pull it apart with you rather than just focusing on, on my business. But so yeah, dump it into the chat dump it onto any of the social platforms and hopefully we can get some interaction um but all of a sudden if i've got a focus for each quarter that ties back to my why then it's relevant to me on a daily basis it's not this label that we stick up on the wall and go this is our vision and our values and blah 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 it's boring and no one reads it it becomes, it becomes a thing that we're working on every single day, which ties towards the longer term purpose. So then you go, well, in light of that, we've obviously got to earn some revenue. What are our revenue streams? So for us, the revenue streams are obviously accounting. There's some mentoring we do. And there's some workshops we run. So then I go, well, for each of those revenue streams, which tie into our why, you know, there's a connection between simplifying and the revenue that we earn or educating and the revenue that we earn. What are the critical pillars that sit under each one of these? What are the levers we've got to pull which create momentum, which create action on these critical pillars? So for us, I go, well, the first critical pillar we've got, and I'd suggest this is probably true for most or every business, is people. And I'm not saying people as in pay greater wages or hire more people or anything like that. You go, if our why is to educate, I need to spend a disproportionate amount of money on training. So the professional development budget for our guys becomes really important. So too does the benefits that we offer them. So too is pay important. But the wages is of less relevance if people are trained well, if they're getting good benefits, because I wrote an article about this earlier in the week. You know, you look at, the world at the moment, and we've got massive inflation. Yeah, it's kind of replaced COVID as the chat around the water cooler. So you go, well, inflation means that my team come to work feeling more stressed about money because they've got to pay more grocery bills, they've got to pay more in rent, whatever it is. And if they're turning up feeling stressed about money, they're not going to be able to do their best work. So if I can offer them some benefits, which might be small things, a decent coffee machine, that relieves some financial pressure, 
then they're going to do a better job. Or if I can offer them an environment where they get overtime, they're going to work harder or they're going to work more. Sorry, they're not going to work harder. They're going to work more. So you go, well, the critical pillar here is people. And then you go, well, if my why is to educate customers and if I've trained my people on how to educate customers, what tools or technology do my people need to be able to spot the customer that needs educating? So for us, for example, one of our tools is our CRM. One of our tools is our kind of lead generation. A lead generation software. So if we're having a, a conversation with a customer and it turns out that they need help with managing their staff or finding more sales or the cash flow. My people need, need to be able to plug that into the CRM system and go, John needs help with sales strategy. That then needs to feed into a marketing machine at scale without me as the business owner having to get involved because God knows we're all time poor, right? Feed into the lead gen and go, send John this email sequence about sales and marketing or about cash flow or about budgeting. Because the technology can drive our why, which is to simplify, which is to educate. The, the lead generation system is simplifying my life because I don't need to have 100 conversations about budgeting. I can have one and do it at scale. We get better insights on who the customers are, what they need and how we can help them. So this stuff becomes so important. Or you might look at it and go, you know what? We want to run some client events. And frankly, I can spend as much money as I like on this stuff because it's going to shift the needle. This is the stuff that's going to move my business forward as opposed to a budget which turns around and goes, you can spend three grand a year on client events. Like, telling me I can spend three grand a year on client events just doesn't, doesn't help. It helps though if I go, the three grand on client events is going to be three events here, here, and here. Each one's going to cost a thousand bucks and it's going to push towards the strategy of the why we're in business in the first place and everyone's happy. But for us, we've then got an, another pillar down underneath, which is our customers. And this kind of stuff is, for example, how we, um, how we streamline the admin for our customers. So if you deal with IRD, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of crap that goes back and forth. So if I want to simplify their administration, I'm happy to have an internal staff member's wages in this pillar because it's going to make our, our lives easier for our customers. This is a long way away from what a regular budget looks like. So your regular budget or your regular profit and loss might go something like your... Your, expense, uh, your revenue up the top, and then under your revenue, you might have some cost of sales. So some direct costs, some costs that go up and down relative to what your turnover is doing. And then underneath that, you might have some overheads. So here we're talking things like rent, phone, office expenses. It's the stuff that doesn't change regardless of how much you, you earn. And there's merit in doing it that way. But there's no connection to why we're in business in the first place. So for me, if we break our profit and loss report down into revenue, critical pillar, critical pillar, critical pillar, critical pillar, which all connect to why we're in business in the first place, then your why and your vision and, and your values, instead of being a thing up on the wall that look pretty, become something that you can use every day. Become something that feeds through the entire business model. 
they become this thing that is actually real and is alive rather than this underwhelming billboard on the corner of a wall somewhere. So you go, well, I begin. If I'm going to go down this budgeting path, where do I go? How do I start? And for me, there's six real six questions. And the first question, obviously, is what are the pillars? So if I've said a pillar is technology, and I want to hammer this one home in that the way for our businesses to become more productive, efficient, effective is through the better use of digital technology. So if my pillar is technology, there's a do the job component to that. So for an accountant, that's zero. For you, that might be some job management software. So there's a do the job thing. There's a find my customers thing, which is your CRM and your marketing automation. Then underneath that, there's this insight thing. So how do I get the data in a way that's visible, which shows me how the different areas of my business are going. So you work out what your pillars are. And then I go, in five years' time, what does that pillar look like? You know, in five years' time, should I have the software giving me daily KPIs on each of the critical pillars? Now, that's going to be a wee while away. But if you have this view of the world, which today tells you where you're at and where you're going in a long-term, not a 12-month budget, a five-year thing, then the connection is real. So I want my technology pillar in five years from now to be able to tell my team when a business's cash flow has got tighter. I want my technology piece to tell my team when a customer's sales are dropping as much as when a customer's sales are increasing. Because for me as an accountant, there's an opportunity for me to sell them more and to be able to grow my business. But equally, there's an opportunity for us to be able to help them. And if I don't get the technology piece right or the technology pillar, then yes, I could get that same insight by going through every single customer's ledgers one by one by one by one and that becoming a full-time job for someone. But that's not scalable. That's not efficient. That's not effective. The technology can do it if I take the next five years to, to build it. So then I go, well, within each pillar, let's get really, really micro. And this is the third, the third question to ask. So first of all, we've gone, what are the pillars? Then what's the five-year view of them? Then I go, let's go really small. So in your people pillar, for example, what am I spending money on? And is that stuff that is going to shift the needle? You know, we've all got expenses that we kind of rack up because we've always just racked them up. You know, it's the $2.99 a month subscription for your Google storage. And you go, well, do I need that or not? Rather than it just being this thing that ticks on from month to month to month like water torture. So go really small and look at the, the $2.99 spend right through to the $2,000 spend. And none of the spend is right or wrong if it's in line with the rules that are going to push you towards your why quicker. Because all too often we, we do a budgeting process by going, you know, let's take last year's PL. and And then let's add 5% on top or 3% or whatever it is. So stuff naturally inflates or increases and then you, you dump some inflation on top. And all of a sudden your budget's up the, the wazoo and you're not earning enough to make it worthwhile. So the smaller you go, the more granular you go, the better off you're going to be. So then the fourth question you want to ask yourself is, well, how hard should I push? So we've got this five-year view of what a pillar should look like. And you go, well, I could wait five years for that, but you know, what would it look like if I did it in 12 months? 
And if you do it in 12 months, there's going to be risk that comes along with that. And you go, well, with that risk, then how can I mitigate it? So how can I reduce the, the risk down a level to a point where it's so far removed that it kind of becomes tolerable or that it becomes a risk that I can accept as a business owner? And you go, well, what would it look like if I doubled my staffing? Or what would it look like if I doubled my turnover? How would that affect each pillar? What would that mean for my technology? What would that mean for me as a leader? And then you go, oh, it kind of looks like hard work. Don't want to do it in 12 months. I'd rather keep it at five years. And that might be okay. As long as you've turned your mind to it and as long as you've had the conversation. Because psychologically, we're more scared of loss than we are of gaining something. So you go, well, if the reason I'm not pushing harder is because I'm scared of losing what I've got, is that a valid reason not to push harder? Or if I don't push hard now, I have to wait longer to get what I want. And am I comfortable with that delay? So you've really got to challenge yourself on how hard you want to go. And if the answer is, I don't want to go that hard, then that's okay. As long as, again, as you've turned your mind to it. As I was saying earlier on, 2022 financial year, Convex Accounting pushed really hard. Um, and I didn't mitigate the risk well enough. And we had some losses as a result people-wise, financially, and customers. And there's risk that comes along with being in business. And I didn't mitigate that risk well enough. And we kind of paid the price for it. But do I regret paying that price? No, not for a second. Because, you know, I said, I've got a five-year vision and this is the year we're going to go for it. And we ran really, really hard and we fell over. But that's part of it. And if I hadn't fallen over or if I hadn't tried it in the first place, then you'd always kind of wonder, right? And you'd never be quite sure what it could have been. So you just got to look at it and go, how hard can I push? How much risk can I tolerate? That was a risk I could tolerate and I was happy with it. So we ran. Now the strategy this year is a little different, but it's pushing just as hard in a slightly different direction. And that's okay. Because while I was running and while we fell over, You've also got to look at it and go, and this is the, the fifth question, you go, well, what is it that I want as a leader? What is it that I want from my business and from my budget? Because if it's not giving you that, there's no point being in business. You might as well get a job, right? And that's maybe a little negative, but you go, most of us went into business in the first place or self-employment in the first place to to get more kind of time. We want to get more time back in our days. So we set up in business so that we've got kind of the flexibility to work how we want to work. And then you go, others went into business to get more control over what their life looked like. You know, for me, I want to be able to work from home when I want to work from home so I can hang out with my kids during the school holidays. And I'm still anxiously wondering when they're going to burst into the, into the room behind me. Um, but before we know it, the to-do list is that long and we have less time than what we ever had. And then our days become out of control and we work every hour of the day just to get through this massive to-do list. And then funnily enough, we don't earn as much as we probably should as well. You know, we all slog our guts out every day. Yet a lot of us don't earn what we should. So you go, we went into business for time, control or money. And we didn't end up with any of it. So I look at it and go, well, if we're going to do a budget, let's make sure that the budget sits with our personal why, like why we bothered to go into business in the first place, time, control, money. And then you go, in light of that, are each of the pillars, on the other hand, supporting us as business leaders to get our businesses going? Are they motivating us? Are they exciting enough for us? Or is it just something that's trapping us into working more and more every day. And that oscillates, right? I know for me, when I first went into business, um, probably 10 years ago now, it was me on my own out the back of a car. So I couldn't afford a, a, an office, had no customers. So 
the purpose for me then was to hustle and find customers. And the reason my wife for doing it was because it was new and exciting. And I wanted to prove to myself that I could, could make a crack of being in business on my own. And you know, the first day of being in business and walking down Lampton Quay in Wellington, I'm thinking, man, I can find customers up and down Lampton Quay. And it was motivating and exciting. And I worked out how to do it. But then I got to this point where I had a team of, probably four or five and I had more and more questions coming at me every day and my to-do list blew up and I was out of control and um, everything kind of piled up on top of me and I wasn't enjoying it and my headspace wasn't great. And you go, well, what happened there? And at that point I had this budget that was a budget to pay everyone else's wages. It wasn't a budget that paid people to serve customers the right way or pay people to give me the back office support that I needed to do the work that I wanted to do. And our growth as a result of not having a budget that was in line with our business strategy kind of slowed us down for a couple of years. And, you know, it, it came with a bit of heartache, but that's okay. And then you go, well, after that, I worked out that I had to reclaim why I was in business in the first place. And I had to get a really close connection to that and the budget. And they had to become one and the same. Because if they're not, we're chasing dollars on a budget for the sake of chasing dollars on a budget. And that doesn't go well for anyone. So then I go, well, now that I've come back and I've gone... Why am I in business? How much do I want to earn? How much support do I need? How hard should I push? I then start again and I go, well, what are the pillars that I need? And it becomes this process. So you go through the six questions. You go pillar, five-year view, really small and micro. What if I push harder? What do I want as a business owner? Then you go, what are the pillars? What's the five-year view? What's the micro? How do, what if I push harder? And you keep iterating on this loop and you go through 72 different versions of the pillars and what they could look like now, what they could look like in five years' time. And all of a sudden, we've totally flipped the budgeting from being this thing that controls us to this thing that goes, spend as much money on whatever you want, go for your life, as long as that is getting you towards the success of that pillar and the success of that pillar driving the why of why you're in business in the first place. Because if we can connect that loop, then everything moves ahead a lot quicker. But, 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 but. The thing that a lot of people get wrong with their budgets, doing it the old way or doing it the new way, whatever way you like, is that they do their budget and then they go, I'm done. And they tick it off and they move on to the next thing in the to-do list. The thing with the budget is that it's not one and done. It's not something you tick off the list. It's a constant conversation that you've got to be having with yourself with your accountant with your business mentors with the, the people that you have in your community as a as a sounding board to go well what if we did this what if i hire this new person what i what if i invest in this new piece of technology how do i grow at twice the speed how would my profit look if i halved the size of our staff what would it look like if I said yes to this? Or what would it look like if I said no to that? It's a conversation, right? And the more we have the conversation about what our budget's doing in light of the business strategy that we're pushing towards, the more likelihood there is that we'll actually achieve the strategy that we're after. So if I come right back to Convex Legal, my wife's business, 56% um, growth in a year. She was pretty happy with that, and she should be. And it came from a place of her going, what is it that I want as the business leader? And she said to herself, you know what? I don't want to work as much as I was, and I, I'm speaking for her, so I find it a little bit awkward, but she didn't want to work as much as she was because, and she won't mind me saying this, she was kind of working too much. And it was having a cost to our family, to our relationship. And I was doing the same. So that was having a cost as well. So you go, you know what? We've all just got to take a step back here and, and not work as much and not put as much pressure on ourselves. 
so what was the pillar that she used to to support that and the pillar in that case was hiring two people so she hired jenny and joe who are exceptional at what they do and are just some of the loveliest people i've ever worked with and they support and they encourage and they push and that helped Catherine do more of the work that she's really, really good at, which is engaging with people um, in a way that not a lot of lawyers are. And then you go, well, between the three of them, that helped them shift the, the revenue number along with the rest of the team. And then you go, well, what pillar supported Catherine, Jenny and Joe to help drive that? And you go, well, the pillar that was underneath that was technology so they use a piece of software called called process street and it defines the business from top to bottom so there's real consistency on a the technical work but b how they engage with their customers so you go well they've got the technical bit sorted they've got the customer bit sorted so good work delivered in a really human sort of fashion which then frees catherine at the top of the organization to lead so the connection between pillar and success was really clear so pillar and what that pillar needed to look like along with that then feeding into to the overall kind of goal of her business which is kind of around simplifying the technical and delivering an exceptional experience because if you deliver a good experience your customers are happy and your staff enjoy doing the work because you know all of our teams come to work wanting to deliver really good work every single day come hell or high water you know, i think there are very few people that come to work not wanting to do a good job so you look at it and you go she had a budget that facilitated the growth and it all came together but that's what i wanted to run through today but i think if you haven't had a chance as yet to download the download the template please do it's it's something i find I, I feel really passionate about simply because kind of we've done budgeting wrong for so long and as accountants i think we've let people do budgeting wrong so download the template and and kind of change up how you view budget because a budget needs to be this thing that empowers you to spend money on anything you like whenever you like without guilt without shame without buyer's remorse. The caveat at the top of that is, as long as the spending fits the why, as long as the spending drives a pillar towards the critical success factor quicker. Because if you're spending money for the sake of spending money, well, there's no point. If you're spending money to achieve your purpose and to shift the needle quicker, and fill your boots so look, that's all from me but thank you very much for joining me today um, if you do have any questions comments or anything along those lines feel free to um, feel free to reach out to me so look me up on linkedin stalk me that's what linkedin's for right stalk away um, send me a message and i promise to come back to every single one of you um, otherwise download that worksheet and i think it's going to transform how you do your budgeting moving forward yeah, cool. We actually did have um, Lauren kind of dropped in the chat um, that her work, her business is all about building great homes and having the process, have the process be enjoyable for their clients, for our clients. Um, so that's what she's up to. Mm. Sounds like a wonderful thing. I know that building homes can be very uh, stressful for the yeah. client. So having that client focus and making sure that they feel supported along through that journey is probably epically important and wow. also ties greatly into your success of um, referral business, which is, you know, ultimately some of the best kind of um, what leads is, uh... Absolutely, right? So, so I look at it and go, if I'm in the home building business, one of, one of the pillars sure is the building and construction team. Absolutely, because you know, they're the ones that are facing the customer every day. But I also go, well, you've got a site form in there every single day. What's the tool that enables that site form in to engage with your customer in the best way possible? Now, the person is probably a really great builder and often isn't great at communicating and dealing with people. I, I totally get that. But if you can put solid tools around them that go that every week site form in, please send three photos. Those three photos then get sent automatically to the customer, which then populates your Instagram page and a whole lot of stuff around that. Then it becomes really easy for people to look you up and for people to refer. 
That's a great so, tip. I love that. And, yeah. and it's, if we can connect those different dots together, then everything becomes really easy. If you've got stuff that sits in isolation, like your budget or your business plan or how you deal with customers on, on its own, then, then you kind of go nowhere and it's pointless. Mm. Mm, mm. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear, Lauren, like what you put in place, you know, what are your pillars currently, or do you need a little bit of help with that to kind of figure out what's happening there? And I'm just going to jump across to the socials as well. Um, people are kind of coming in and out. So I'll just have a quick look. Um, yeah, if you have some questions for Hamish, please drop them in the chat while we're still here. Um, because it, I think... Uh, there was a lots of things that you said in this talk. Sometimes I, I feel like I, I just like to listen because I'm getting little bits and pieces and then I'm going to take bits and pieces and apply them where they fit into my story, you know, or into um, people that I know's story and how I could assist them with those bits of advice that you always get uh, asked. If you're constantly chatting with people like yourself, you know, you become this little bank of knowledge that you... <laughs> <laughs> that you kind of shoot out in moments <laughs> um, during just casual conversations. But um, yeah, I think that this is that connecting back to the why is just so important. It also will help to keep you going. I think that's the other thing. You know, people always say, you know, if you don't have your why when it gets really tough, then you generally will bow out because it's just the reason behind what you're doing isn't great yeah. enough yeah. um doesn't have enough buy it, you know weight on it to keep you in the game because i mean obviously now i'm employed but i in the past have owned a number of of um, businesses and it is a 24 hour a day seven day a week yeah. gig you know you do do it because you want the freedom to make your own schedule and you know be able to take on the jobs that you want and do what you want but at the end of the day you know you're your own paycheck and so you kind of go oh okay you're still hustling i feel like it's a hustle you know that you're yeah. to get yourself set up and get it going but a lot of times it is put into that baseline of having that really great structure in the beginning um so that as you as you are doing the hustling, you get to a point where you don't have to work as hard to create the same effect. You know what I mean? Um, and I've watched people do that and they have worked really hard for two years and then they've been able to hire in people and kind of start to ease off some of the things that they don't like to do and get other people to step in and do that. Would you agree with that? Hinge? Yeah, I oh, look totally. And I, th I think a, a lot of that, so to, to go to your first point, which is when the going gets tough, right? You go, if I've got my why, it's easier. And I think for me, when when it got tough for me, I forgot what that was. Mm, mm. And then you go, well, I'm slogging my guts out, you know, yeah. seven to seven, seven to eight. And you go, well, why am I bothering? Like, what's yeah. the point? And then you go, I don't know what I'll do. I'll go and buy something because that'll make me <laughs> feel better. <laughs> I'll go and buy a new laptop because if I've got a new laptop, it'll be great. Or I will go and invest in a Google marketing campaign because then I feel like I'm doing something and it's going to change. Mm. But then you go, shit, should I have done that? And then you feel awkward and you get this guilt and resentment because you've been spending mm. money that you don't have because the going's tough. Mm. Mm. And it just falls apart. So you go, well, if I can remember why I'm bothering in the first place, mm. If I do need to spend, because we all need therapy, retail therapy from, well, probably we all need therapy from time to time, but we all need retail therapy from time to time. Um, if I'm going to spend some money on something and if mm -hmm. I just need to splurge, then let's make sure it's something that's connected back to that why. Yeah. Because yeah. then it's going to And be I guess from an accounting point of view, that's very helpful because it also is a business investment, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So you're going to, you know, put that in on your taxes. We've yeah. got a thing here um, from Lauren, just a follow up. So she said, we currently don't use a job management system as they seem too clunky. So we do things manually. We're open to suggestions. Currently, Brett does lots of customer contact as he is really good at it. So Brett, I'm assuming is on your sales team or is he in your construction team or, you know, is he on the ground or is he kind of at the office? And then I guess like management systems, job management systems. Oh, he's the director. Um, job management systems. Look, there's a lot in the construction kind of realm. You've got Fergus, you've got Tradeify, you've got, um, I'm trying to think of any other ones that I know offhand. I've had both of those guys on and, um, yeah. you know, 
yeah, Dan Pollard from Fergus Hill, he's got some golden nuggets, just like you, Hamish. They can just come on and just kind of share a bit of wisdom of having built businesses, kind of failed at that business, or not saying that you failed, mm-hmm. but, you know, he definitely failed and then, you know, built it up again and then, you know, got it right like the second time, you know, second or third time or what have you. And um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from those failing forward, we call it, don't we? Or John Maxwell does, you know? So, um, so yeah, it, it, it's really interesting to chat with those guys, but there are a lot of software that you can use with your team. So if you are looking for some solutions to that, because you feel like the software that you're finding isn't working for you, just contact our support team and we'll have a look at your business because you're in more of a I guess what is that building or construction? Would you call it building manufacturing? Construction, yeah. Yeah. So we'll have a look and and give you some tips on some tools that might work for you. Just contact support at digitalboost.co.nz and um and we'll we'll delve into your world. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of other things here as well. So I look at it and go, if Brett is really good at Mm. customer contacts then let's just get him doing that the whole time yeah it's, if yeah. he's good at it it's probably the bit he likes yeah and the job management is probably the thing that he doesn't like so if you get the right system going then you go well his world all of a sudden gets better because he can do the stuff that he cares about and he can do the stuff that's going to shift the needle for the customer which is how he engages with them and then i go well, what system do you recommend and tradeify is amazing fergus is amazing co-construct is amazing like there's a whole lot of really good software out there mm-hmm. um but the first part for me is going, well, let's document in a really clear way. So let's flow chart up what the current process you've got is. And then let's find a system that fits into that as best as possible, rather than um, kind of letting the business be dictated to by what the software's constraints are. So we yeah. map up, map up mm. what you do, map up how you do it. And then you go, well, does Tradeify do that best or does Fux do that best? Because yeah. these are all great pieces of software that are built here in New Zealand. But we've just got to find the one that's best for you in your situation. And I would definitely say um, like a quarterly or, you know, twice a year having a look at your software systems. I mean, obviously, if you've got a whole bunch of people that are tied into these software systems um, that are using it on a daily basis, you know, there's education that has to be done with your team. And so you don't want to be switching it out all the time. Um, but, I, you know, because that will drive everybody crazy. <laughs> we do that a lot. At Digital Boost, you know, we're like the... I guess the here in the digital landscape, we're, we're digital tools people. And so we're constantly trying out new digital tools, but there comes a point where we as a team or members of the team go, please stop adding more tools. Let's my my, my team first. at work, yeah. station, they, they station intervention. So they all got me into the meeting room and they're all sitting down. I'm looking at them going, what if I walked into it? And they're like, Hamish, no more system changes. And if you want to bring in a new system, you've got to take an old one out. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm, I'm fully on board with what they're saying there. As yeah. I often am the person going, wait, how, are we fully using this tool to its potential? Or are we using like the very top layer of it? And we could, what you're trying to do with this other tool is actually a feature of the tool that we're already using. We just are not utilizing that part of that service. So do look at that. But I, what, yeah, but what I would say is do an evaluation on your tech stack. That's the tools that you're using for your whole business, probably quarterly or, you know, twice a year or at least once a year because tech changes so much. And, you know, a lot of these SaaS platforms, these software platforms, you know, like Tradeify, like, um, uh, what did I, what did, oh, Fergus, yes. like they, they alter what they do. They add more features and sometimes you can drop one of the other tools because they've added it to this other tool. They've got enough feedback from their customer base that have said, please look, I'm having to use so many systems. Can you please just add this as a feature? To this tool so we can be in all one spot and so a lot of places are doing that i mean you look at monday.com and they they have like everything you could possibly do on that tool like i don't we don't personally use it in our um tech stack but i know a lot of people that swear by it because it just has so much functionality yeah. you know yeah yeah but i don't know um i guess that's one of the benefits of being in the tech world you know what's out there or you can find out what's out there. I think it's what's challenging for a lot of small businesses is that you don't know what you don't know. Is that yeah. right? And, and look, that's just a question of asking the right people the right stuff. So mm-hmm. you go, who, who knows about digital yeah. apps? Who knows about platforms? And Digital Boost is a great place to start. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> you. you know, like talk to 
talk to other business owners, you know, talk to your accountant, mm. talk to people in your community who go, you know, what, what is it that you use? How do you use it? And what are your expectations for it? Because if you've got clear expectations for what the, the software is going to do, and you're really clear about what you, you need it to do, mm. then you can run ahead. So yeah, people, people jump to zero, for example, and, mm. and I love zero. I've grown my whole business off the back of it. And they go, zero is going to change my business financial management. Mm. And the secret is it's not. It's not going to change anything mm. unless you use it properly. Yeah, that's right. And you design your system to work or you design your business to work in the system. Mm. you got to do the same with, with Tradeify, with Fergus, whatever it is you want to do and just get right. the right people doing the right stuff. And I think that what, what you said there was really applicable to when we talk about accounting and we talk about budgeting, you know, your accountant is not just a person that you go to to get your taxes done you know, your accountant and, you know, I'm sure hopefully you'll validate this is somebody that, you know, you can go to, to talk about the financial landscape of your business and really discuss ways that you can, where you can, you know, get some advice on this is what my business looks like. And when you use systems like zero, it allows that transparency between you and your accountant um, to be able to have a real live uh, look at what's happening within your business financially and with your cash flow. And, um, and you can make some decisions about this budgeting, you know, where you're going to reinvest and where you can scale up or where you can outsource. And um, I think that's a misconception that a lot of folks have is that accountants just do taxes, but they do so much more like your firm does so much as far as just business development, I know that's a different kind of area, but the reason why I feel like uh, um, many accountants firms um, expanded is because that's what you guys are good at. You know that this underpins business. And in essence, you know how to grow a business from that standpoint through that focal oh, lens. And we're really lucky. We're really mm. privileged because I get to work with business owners every single day of the week. Mm. And I can kind of cherry pick the things that work for them and the things mm. that don't. And can copy paste and, and do the same thing again and again with different customers to really be able to experiment and get a good handle on, on what works and what doesn't because mm. yeah, every business goes through a journey. Yeah, you start out small and you go, okay, kind of worked it out and you reach this point and then you go actually a bit harder than I thought. So you sink back down and then you get some income and lifestyle back and every business goes through that journey, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an accountant, whether you're an engineer, it's all the same, different mm. stuff, all the mm. same though. And the things that hold one business back from moving up that curve will be the same things that hold another business back. And equally, the things that push someone up will be the same things that propel someone else forward as well. So um, I, I just want to stress that you know, you use your accountant who has been there and done that. And if if you're not getting what you need, there, there, are, there are lots of accountants out there. Yeah, there's lots of accountants. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just, um, before we finish up, because it is time to go, I would just like to say, um, make sure that you download that PDF that um, Hamish put up with that QR code. Um, maybe you'll send it through to me as well, and I can put it up on the website yeah. um, as, a, as a little learning summary, or I believe they're not called learning summaries anymore. They're called something else, but they sit underneath the video. Uh, and you can just download the PDFs. And so if we'll put it there on, on site for you to utilize and have a go at it. And if you have some challenges, stalk Hamish on LinkedIn. <laughs> no, I'm not hard to find. Plug my name into LinkedIn, <laughs> flick me a message, and I'm, I'm happy to help out. No worries at all. Yeah, it sounds great. So um, thank you so much, Hamish. You, it's always a delight. I missed out last time you were here. I believe I was not here last time. So, um, but I do, I am subscribed to your newsletter. So I see you on a regular basis <laughs> and I know what you're about. So it's a pleasure to actually get to meet you here on uh, Digital Boost. And we're just grateful for your involvement in this initiative and your wisdom and also, you know, all your tips and tricks on how we can move forward and stop feeling that guilt the spend guilt and actually make some good decisions with money to propel our businesses forward. So thank you. No, not at all. Thanks for having me. Mm. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Tomorrow is Friday. Just as a quick reminder, and you can do this too, Kamish. Um, well, actually, I don't know. You might have too many employees to do this, but um, small businesses. So if you're a Digital Boost mm -hmm. member, um, you can put up special offers for your business on Fridays in our Facebook community group. If you've got a special offer, it doesn't matter what your business is, you can pop it up there on the community page. We'd love to see your offers for the weekend or the whatever your sales are that you have. Let us know because we often um, 
like invest in those small businesses. We love seeing what's happening out there. And as a special treat tomorrow, I have um, a special guest coming on from the Good Registry. And that's going to be a little bit of an interview style. I'm going to be talking about that small business's journey to creating good in the world. Um, lots of donations. It's a social enterprise kind of business. So it's quite beautiful. So thanks, Hamish. Thanks. Nice. Thank your whole team from Convex Accounting for helping us to get this together. Appreciate it. No problem at all. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Kakite, thank you.